From the Stop 3 Overlook of Valle Grande, we will next travel along the southern boundary of the caldera to reach Stop 4, an impressive overlook of San Diego Canyon. But before leaving Stop 3, let's do one more Google Air flight, this time circumnavigating the resurgent dome Redondo and following the ring fracture volcanoes inside the caldera. There are eight significant ring fracture volcanoes, and it is possible that the elliptical path connecting them represents the original caldera collapse structure. Just imagine when the caldera collapse occurred, instantly creating a giant hole in the ground with near vertical crater walls. Right away, these unstable vertical walls would begin to collapse and landslide into the newly formed caldera, quickly widening the diameter of the caldera rim. So let's begin our flight from a high perspective just south of the caldera. The blue line outlines the Valles caldera boundary and the green line outlines the Toledo embayment. Remember that the Toledo caldera essentially formed in the same place as the Valles but included an extension to the northeast termed the Toledo embayment. In between the two caldera eruptions, a large volcano formed in the embayment termed Cerro Toledo. As we begin to descend towards the south rim of the Valles caldera, Cerro del Medio is highlighted. This was the first ring fracture volcano to erupt inside the caldera a little over 1.2 million years ago. Five more ring fracture volcanoes formed in the northern part of the caldera, erupting approximately every 100,000 years and ending with San Antonio volcano about 560,000 years ago. Shortly after the San Antonio eruption, another ring fracture volcano on the south side of the caldera formed South Mountain. Then, after a long hiatus of nearly half a million years, the El Cajete ring fracture eruption began at approximately 55,000 years ago, forming the El Cajete crater. The last gasp from El Cajete occurred about 40,000 years ago as a viscous rhyolite lava poured out to the west-southwest, termed the Banco Benito. All told, eight major ring fracture volcanoes have formed inside the Valles caldera, all peripheral to the resurgent dome. Will there be another? My guess is yes, but the really safe bet is that it's not going to happen during my lifetime. Okay, the El Cajete volcano is really fascinating and erupted an incredibly diverse package of volcanic deposits, including tephra, pyroclastic flows, and finally, a thick, pasty lava flow. The initial phase started with a powerful eruption column that went at least 25 kilometers high, resulting in a thick tephra deposit of ash, crystals, pumice, and rock fragments. A large pumice mine is located near the crater on the north side of Highway 4, exposing these near-vent tephra deposits. Isopac maps of the tephra show that a south southeast wind at the time of the eruption carried lighter and smaller pumices and ash toward Santa Fe. After many hours of a sustained, intense eruption column, the energy lessened, causing the eruption column to collapse and initiating pyroclastic flows that traveled downslope to the southwest. These pyroclastic flows filled canyons near the head of present-day San Diego Canyon, eventually solidifying into the battleship rock tuff. The namesake for this tuff is a promontory at the confluence of the East Fork Jemez and San Antonio Rivers. The Jemez River is born at this confluence and joins the Rio Grande north of Bernalillo. Following a hiatus of approximately 15,000 years, the El Cajete crater began to ooze a viscous rhyolite lava that flowed downhill to the west and southwest, covering the previous tephra and tuff deposits. This formed the Banco Benito lava flow, which exhibits spectacular crescent-shaped pressure ridges called ogives when viewed from the air. These giant topographic wrinkles are somewhat analogous to pahoehoe textures on the surface of fluid basalt lava flows. Much of the Banco Benito lava is obsidian <clears throat> or dark volcanic glass formed by rapid cooling of silica-rich lava with minimal crystal growth. 
Although several other obsidian lavas in the Jemez Mountains were quarried by ancestral Puebloan and other Native American cultures for use as tools and weaponry, the Banco Benito obsidian was not conducive for such purposes. Large crystals of feldspar and quartz in the obsidian diminished the napping or controlled flaking process needed to shape the tool. Therefore, archaeologists joke that the Banco Benito obsidian is not weapons-grade material. Okay, let's do our short Google Air flight to the next stop on our tour, an overlook of San Diego Canyon. For this flight, we will once again drape bandolier tough exposures from the geologic map onto the topography. You will notice that the bulk of the resurgent dome, Redondo, is composed of the upper bandolier tuff. We begin by pulling back and gaining elevation, putting the south rim of the caldera in the foreground. On the west end of Valle Grande, South Mountain quickly comes into view. This ring fracture volcano erupted a little over half a million years ago. Just on the other side, however, is the young El Cajete crater discussed previously, including the obvious Banco Benito lava flow spilling westwards. You can see Highway 4 below as it climbs on top of the lava flow. Beyond the caldera border, you can see the broad plateau of Bandelier Tuff. As we gradually descend and turn southwards, we get a nice view of San Diego Canyon, which provides the only outlet for water that originates inside the Valles Caldera. This stop will provide a good opportunity to discuss the water history of the caldera, including many lake configurations as the ring fracture volcanoes formed and continually altered the intracaldera landscape. What I'd like to do at this point is talk a little bit about the, the history of the topography inside the Valles Caldera since the eruption. So I have a few very kind of hypothetical depictions of what the landscape looked like after the formation of the Valles Caldera. And probably nowhere else in the Jemez Mountains has been so changing and dynamic as inside the caldera because we've had the uplift of a resurgent dome and many different ring fracture volcanoes come up inside the caldera. But uh, what we know of, and Smith, Bailey, and Ross figured this out during their mapping, is that after the caldera formed initially and all that massive tuff inside the caldera solidified and cooled. Uh, this big, it was still a big hole in the ground and with no outlet for rain and snow. So certainly within a few thousand years, inside the Valles caldera, we start developing a beautiful freshwater lake. A modern day analog would be Crater Lake, Oregon, which is only around 7,000 years since that eruption. And that's got the, I think, the most deepest freshwater lake in North America. But uh, here at the Valles Caldera, within a few thousand years, we certainly developed a beautiful freshwater lake inside the caldera. Now keep in mind, outside the caldera, the pyroclastic flows had filled in all of the valleys, creating these broad plateaus of tuff. So the, the topography was very subdued outside of the caldera after the eruption for a long time. Now within 40 to 50,000 years, up through the lake, the resurgent dome, Redondo, starts to bulge upward and probably formed an island in the middle of this freshwater lake. Shortly after the rising of the resurgent dome, we get the first initial ring fracture volcanic eruption that's going to come up here on the east side of the caldera and that creates the mountain we call today Cerro del Medio. And over the next uh, half a million years, we are going to get a series of these ring fracture volcanoes coming up in the northern part of the caldera and that's going to produce these different uh, volcanic hills we have in the northern part of the caldera. Uh, we still maintain a crater lake 
and there's good evidence to show that kind of the highest level of that lake would have been about 800,000 years ago. Between 800,000 years ago and a half a million years ago, some major developments happened. For one, we have erosion occurring along the southwest rim of the caldera to the point that finally that lake developed an outlet. So we begin to have that initial development of San Diego Canyon at some point be between 800,000 years ago and a half a million years ago. Uh, around a half a million years ago, we have two ring fracture volcanoes occurring. One creates the mountain we call San Antonio. Uh, one creates the mountain we call South Mountain. And both of those eruptions temporarily dammed up the San Antonio Creek and East Fork Jemez, creating lakes in the northern and southeastern part of the caldera. But both of those lakes eventually spilled over, carved new canyons, and connected up and flowed out through San Diego Canyon. So the very last eruption, which I'm standing on right here, this lava flow, came out around 40,000 years ago, the Banco Benito lava flow, and we'll get an excellent perspective on this lava flow from our last stop on the West Rim. So that flat plateau above my head, that's going to be the view of the Valles Caldera from the West Rim. Uh, but I hope you do appreciate that all of this erosion outside of the caldera in the last million years has created all this canyon country carving through these tough plateaus. But if we had been here shortly after the Valles eruption, we would have had none of these canyons and these broad flat plateaus would have extended for miles away from the caldera.